Hello! Happy Earth Day! I'm Matthew Borders, and today I wanted to celebrate by talking about Georgia and its important role in bird migration, both for birds passing through and staying over winter or nesting over summer. We'll talk about the basics of bird migration, the what's, when's, why's, how's, why Georgia is such an important stage in the Atlantic Flyway, which I'll explain in a second. And I'll go over some important migration locations in Georgia and give a few examples of the birds that you'd find there and why these places are so important. We're in the middle of peak spring migration too, so let's get started so you can get out there sooner and see some cool birds. So first off, let's talk about migration itself. Migration is the mass movement of a population of animals from one place to another for an extended period of time in response to some external or internal stimuli. Simple enough, right? This talk will only be focusing on birds, but other animals around the world migrate too, like water buffalo and whales, which is why I give a bit more of a broad definition. So about the when. Birds can start their migrations earlier or later than others, but according to Birdwatcher's Digest, the peak times to see the highest number of birds passing through Georgia in spring is April 20th through 26th, and peak fall migration is end of September through the first week and a half of October, with the coast seeing migrants earlier in spring uh, than us inland, and we seeing migrants earlier in the fall. Overall though, spring migration is generally March through May, and fall migration is generally beginning of September until mid to late October. Some species begin migrating as early as late February in the, for spring, uh, like the purple martin, but most birds have stopped migrating through by mid to late October in the fall. However, oddly enough, some species that migrate inland, like the Tennessee and bay-breasted warblers, are at their peak migration around this time and towards the uh, middle of October when everything else is winding down. Okay, so that's all fine and dandy, but why do birds migrate? Like all things, it varies a little by species, but it all boils down to habitat suitability and food availability. The cues also vary as well, uh, such as temperature and length of daylight, uh, and often a combination of things. And some birds, it's completely innate, meaning that they just feel the urge to migrate when it's time and just get up and go. This leads nicely to our next topic, the hows of migration. In keeping with the previous theme, it varies from species to species. Some species have an innate ability to find their way to their wintering and summering grounds. Uh, some use star position. And according to a paper by Fleisner, uh, there's some evidence to suggest that doves can sense the Earth's magnetic field using their magnet magnetoreceptors or organs in their beaks that help them sense magnetic fields and navigate that way. There's also another bird that will bring up the uh, bobolink that also does this as well, uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So Georgia is important not just as a place where birds pass through on their way, but also as a nesting and wintering destination. I'll go into more detail as I talk about the different biomes, but our state is home to some incredibly important habitats, especially our swamps like Finizzi just down the road and our marshes on the coast. Another thing to note is that there are a good number of birds that don't migrate at all and stay here in Georgia year round. Some good examples are cardinals, Carolina wrens, and pine warblers. There are also many birds that migrate from the tropics to North America. These are called neotropical migrants. Some examples are painted buntings, rose-breasted grosbeaks, and many species of warbler. The chestnut-sided warbler above on the slide is a good example of a neotropical migrant. A fair number of birds do most of their migrating within North America, like American goldfinches, cedar waxwings, like the one above, and pine siskins. These birds can migrate to Central America, but many populations also just spend their time going north and south within North America without crossing any large bodies of water. Which brings us to partial migration. I just wanted to touch briefly on this and say that some birds will migrate between nearby habitats or elevations depending on the season, uh, and this is called partial migration. 
This can also apply to small populations within a usually sedentary species making very short migrations, uh, such as crows and ravens in the far north. This is something generally you see more in more northern and mountainous species, so we won't really go too in depth uh, here about that, but I figured it was worth mentioning. So, when birds migrate, most travel along what are called flyways, which are general north-south routes uh, through a large area. In North America, we have four designated flyways. The Pacific along the west coast and in the dark shading, the Central Flyway through the middle of North America, uh, and the Mississippi just to the east of that, that's the Mississippi Flyway, which follow, roughly follows the Mississippi River, but goes all the way up into the high arctic and then the atlantic flyway along the east coast which is where we're situated we have that nice little arrow there to point that out so many birds cross the gulf of mexico when migrating the atlantic flyway such as the ruby-throated hummingbird and many warblers such as american red starts and cape may warblers so many of them stop along our coasts to fuel or refuel depending on if they're coming or going our marshes and barrier islands, like Jekyll and Tybee Island, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, are especially important for this. In the winter especially, our coasts are home to many species of shorebirds that breed in the high Arctic and travel all the way down south to spend the winter on our coasts. Our inland wetlands like Finizzi Swamp and the Okefenokee are also important stopover stations and places where birds spend their summer or winter. For example, Finizzi, just down the road, is the winter home of many waterfowl, like northern shovelers, lesser and greater scop, and hooded mergansers. While our coasts are vital to many birds, there are quite a few that migrate through the center of our state on their way to the Appalachian Mountains, which start in the northwestern corner of Georgia and are home to some absolutely stunning birds like the endangered cerulean warbler or the absolutely gorgeous scarlet tanager which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. So let's talk habitat for a second. One of, if not the most important aspect of what makes a good stopover slash summering slash breeding ground uh, slash wintering ground is habitat. Georgia is home to an array of different ecosystems that are important to different species of birds. Again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but here are a few standout examples on the slide. First off, let's start close to home with swamps like Finizzi. Um, wetlands in general are vital to many species of animals, but swamps and other freshwater wetlands are quite special. Just speaking of migratory birds, they're important to ducks, warblers like the stunning prothonotary warbler, uh, and yellow warbler, summer tanagers, and Wilson's snipes. Uh, our saltwater marshes on the coast, like those surrounding Jekyll and Tybee Island, are probably our most ecologically important habitats. Not only for many birds like Virginia rails, salt marsh sparrows, and Nelson sparrows, but also fish, crabs, oysters, and other economically and ecologically important marine species. I could easily make this a talk about the importance of marshes alone, but I'll reel it back a little because we've got a lot more ground to cover. On a related note though, our beaches are incredibly important for wintering and migrating shorebirds. Sandpipers like sanderlings and ruddy turnstones, black terns, and the endangered piping plover all make use of our shorelines, whether they're returning from their breeding grounds in the far north or just passing through. Tappy Island in particular is a major shorebird wintering destination. Birds like royal terns and gold bill terns regularly nest along our shores in the summer as well. Many birds pass through our Piedmont region on their way to the Appalachian Mountains, but it's also important as summering and wintering grounds too for birds like chipping sparrows, yellow-breasted chats, and indigo buntings. Uh, now let's talk about a few popular migration points in Georgia. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are some particular points of interest. Some of these I know from personal experience and others I was able to find about at audubon.org slash news slash birding Georgia. If you're ever in doubt, places like your local Audubon Society chapter's website 
or other local birding websites on Google are great for finding out good places to see migrating birds. If you want to go out and see some migrants for yourself, I've put three links in the next slide, including the one I just mentioned, if you want to pause the video and check them out. Again, uh, you can check these out too for more info, but now let's get into the nitty gritty of each of these places. The way I'll frame this is that I'll tell you a little bit about each hotspot, then introduce you to a handful of migratory birds that use said area at some point in migration. So let's start off with a spot close to home. The Finizzi Swamp Wildlife Management Area is a freshwater wetland right here in Richmond County. According to the Department of Natural Resources, the wildlife management area is 1,500 acres, but according to the Audubon Society, the actual swamp itself is 5,500 acres. It consists of swamp, freshwater marsh, and several holding ponds. It's an incredibly important wintering destination for various species of ducks, such as greater and lesser scop, northern shovelers, ringneck ducks, and hooded merganser. It's also important breeding habitat for various species of migratory waterfowl and songbirds as well. Some examples include common gallinules, prothonotary warblers, and hooded warblers. It's also an important destination for migratory birds of prey too, like northern harriers and peregrine falcons in the winter. In winter, flocks of rusty blackbirds and red-winged blackbirds can also be found in the trees and freshwater marshes of the area, as well as different species of sparrow, like chipping sparrows and song sparrows. In the spring or fall, if you may get lucky and see a Cape May warbler, like the one on the slide, although only the males in spring will look like the one that we see here. The Swamp's Wildlife Management Area has an education center and often holds educational programs open to the public, so if you're in that neck of the woods, the friendly staff there would love to fill you in on more. They also have educational videos on their website, and you'll see I have a link up here on the slide if you want to pause the video and check that out too. There's a whole lot more I can talk about here, but we have more to talk about, and I don't want to talk your ears off forever, so on we go. So again, before we leave Finizzi for good, I just wanted to show off a few of their migratory residents. On the left, you see a lovely purple gallinule, one of the refuge's summer wetland residents. These fairly shy marsh denizens are easy to spot with their bright iridescent plumages that stand out beautifully against the wetland plants. These birds are only summer migrants here, but just a bit further south you can see them year round. There are permanent populations in Central America and the Caribbean as well. In the center, we have a song sparrow, one of the marsh and open grassland winter residents. This is one of the most highly variable species of birds in terms of plumage in North America, with many different subspecies across the continent. We only see one of those subspecies in the winter, and it's the same one you see in the slide above, so no need to worry too much. These birds are found all over North America and even in Central America, but we only see them here in our area around Finizzi, Augusta in the winter. Now on the far right, we have a male and female ring-necked duck, uh, one of several ducks that commonly use the refuge in the winter and can be found in the refuge's many impoundments and ponds. These ducks appear somewhat similar to the greater and lesser scop, which they're commonly seen with, but pay close attention to their tricolored beaks that are a dead giveaway to their identity. So in South Georgia, we have another swamp, the Okefenokee. I could teach an entire class about how amazing the Okefenokee is, but I'm gonna try to laser focus in on just migratory birds with just a few background facts to give you a bit of a better picture of this incredible wetland. So spanning across the Georgia-Florida border, the Okefenokee is one of the largest intact freshwater ecosystems in the world at over 353,981 acres, making it a wetland of international importance according to the Fish and Wildlife Service. Its most famous avian resident is the highly endangered red cockaded woodpecker, um, that, but that's a sedentary bird, it doesn't migrate, um, but it's also important to migratory birds like sandhill cranes, many warbler species like prothonotary warblers like the one on the screen, 
and northern perulas and ducks as well, just like Fenizzi. Many of the same species that inhabit Fenizzi also inhabit Okefenokee, but there are some differences in abundance, such as the aforementioned sandhill cranes being far more common in the Okefenokee than at Fenizzi. In terms of migratory species, green-winged teals, blue-winged teals, which are both species of ducks, yellow-billed cuckoos, eastern wood peewees, and many more come to nest, winter, or catch a breather on their way to their seasonal destinations. We mentioned them when talking about Fenizzi, but prothonotary warblers, like the one on the slide, are commonly found here nesting in the summer. The unique and pristine swamp provides a plethora of plants that provide shelter and habitat and food uh, in the form of the plants themselves or the smaller wildlife they attract. Once again, I'll leave a link on the slides to the official Fish and Wildlife Services webpage for the Okefenokee if you want to learn more about the swamp, and I highly encourage you to do so. So, once again, a couple of Okefenokee's migrants. On the left, we have a male and female green-winged teal which use the refuge's wetlands for food and shelter in the winter. Look for these smallish ducks swimming with other species. Uh, this is the species that you're likely to see in the winter in most Georgia wetlands, including Fenizzi, just down the road. Uh, they nest up in some of the northern and mis midwestern states, as well as all the way up into Canada, but then disperse over most of North America and into Central America in the winter. In the center, we have a yellow-billed cuckoo. Uh, he could be passing through or staying to nest. Uh, while cuckoos in general are most well-known for laying their eggs in other birds' nests, yellow-billed cuckoos do build their own nests most of the time. They're very secretive, but if you listen for their loud knocking or cooing calls, they're easier to locate as they skulk along the lower canopies. Tent caterpillar infestations are also quite attractive to them as well. Uh, in summer, they nest over much of eastern North America and a few places out west into Mexico uh, and the Caribbean and spend their winters in South America. And on the right, we have the magnificent Sandhill Crane, which may pass through the swamp on its way north or south or may be spending the winter here. While many people confuse great blue herons with cranes, they are completely unrelated to one another. This is the only species of crane you're likely to see in our state. However, the much taller and endangered whooping crane is sometimes, albeit very, very rarely, seen in migration or during the winter. Sandhill cranes nest out in the northwest and way up into Alaska and Canada, then winter in a few places in Texas, California, Florida, and of course here in Georgia. There are also permanent populations here in Florida and the Caribbean. Next up on our list is the lovely Jekyll Island. Located on the southern part of our coast, this is a barrier island that I'm personally familiar with and have helped out with some migratory bird research on and around in the past. Uh, according to the New Georgia Encyclopedia, the island is 5,700 acres and is surrounded by saltwater marsh with maritime, magnolia, live oak, canopy forests with predominantly palmetto and scrub oaks in the understory. In the summer, songbirds like the painted bunting, northern perilla, and summer tanager nest in these forests. The island is lined with dunes and a beachfront as well. Uh, the marshes are incredibly important for winter habitat for sparrows, such as the Nelsons and salt marsh sparrows, and it also provides shelter and food for migrating shorebirds, such as the red knot, spotted sandpipers, and other marsh denizens like the Virginia rail and American avocet. Peregrine falcons, the fastest animal on the planet, can sometimes be seen hunting along these marshes as well in the spring, fall, and winter. In the spring, summer, and fall though, you may get lucky enough to see a roseate spoonbill sifting through the tidal pools at low tide or perched up in one of the small tree islands, also called hammocks, out in the marsh. Uh, I'll show you a picture of them a little bit later. We'll come back to Roseate spoonbills. Uh, it's an incredibly important stopover point for a myriad of migrating songbirds, especially the southern tip of the island. As such, a bird banning, a bird banning operation known as JIBS, or Jekyll Island Banning Station, 
has been operating there every fall since the 1980s. There, they catch migrating birds in mist nets, take their measurements, give them a uniquely coated aluminum band, and then send them on their merry way. I personally helped with this project for about six years, and I can safely say that fall is an incredibly busy time of year for birds on Jekyll, especially pollen warblers, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, I didn't include a bird on the slide just because I wanted to show you what the interior of a maritime forest or island forest looks like. And you can see that pictured on the left. So I mentioned earlier that I helped out with conservation work on Jekyll, uh, particularly with jibs. These are all birds that we banded while I was helping out. Uh, and I think I may have even personally put bands on these birds in the pictures. Just an FYI, this is a perfectly normal and safe way to handle birds uh, at just about any banding station. If you can't prove that you uh, can't handle birds safely, then you won't be allowed to handle them at all. The operation reports to the U.S. Geological Survey and the people who run this operation are licensed professionals. So please, please, please do not try this at home. All right, now that I've gotten that out of the way, on the left, we have one of the many, many, many palm warblers that migrate to slash through Jekyll in the fall. I'm not joking when I say that the banding station occasionally has days where they band over a hundred of these birds in just a few hours. They're fairly nondescript, but are a lot of fun to see in their loose winter flocks. These birds nest high up in the boreal forests of Canada, then winter along the southeast, California coast, Caribbean, and parts of Central America. In the middle, we have a post-second year adult male painted bunting on his way south after probably having nested on Jekyll that summer. These birds are truly even more stunning in real life than they are in the pictures. They're particularly fond of wax myrtle bushes and their berries, and males make themselves conspicuous by loudly singing from high perches in the summer. The females and juveniles are also a striking leaf green color. People who live on the coast uh, often attract them to their backyards by offering white millet in bird feeders. These birds nest around the southeastern coast and in Texas, as well as a few surrounding states, uh, surrounding Texas that is, and into northern Mexico. Then winter in the Caribbean, Central America, southern Mexico, and the southernmost part of Florida. They're also occasionally spotted hanging around our coast in the winter as well. Last but not least, we have a house wren on the right. This little bird was likely on Jekyll to stay for the winter or may have been venturing just a little further south, but overall we only see these birds in the winter on Jekyll. Uh, like their relative, the year-round much larger and much more brightly colored Carolina wren these sprightly little birds are fond of nesting in just about any kind of crevice they can find. Um, whether it's your mailbox, old pair of boots, if they can fit a nest in there, they will. Uh, these birds nest in states across North America, just north of us into Canada and even into the northernmost part of Georgia. Uh, but in the winter, they cover the southern half of the U.S. and migrate all the way down into Central America. Moving uh, north up the coast, about 80 miles, we have Tybee Island. According to the Georgia Encyclopedia, Tybee is about 2.7 square miles and sits right at the mouth of the Savannah River. It's surrounded by salt marsh uh, and its beaches provide important wintering and breeding habitat for a number of shorebirds. In fact, its north end is a well-known spot amongst local birds for seeing large flocks of birds in the winter such as least sandpipers, western sandpipers, sandwich terns, and ruddy turnstones. And the dune line is important breeding habitat for birds like royal terns and the tiny least tern. Passerins, or songbirds, like the orchard oriole, great crested flycatcher, and eastern kingbird are also known to breed on the interior of the island. Much like Jekyll, the marshes surrounding Tybee are highly important habitat for breeding, wintering, and migrating birds as well. Uh, in the winter, northern harriers can be seen gracefully flying low over the reeds looking for smaller birds like swamp sparrows and salt marsh sparrows, and sea ducks like greater and lesser scalp, as well as the magnificent northern gannet, 
uh, can be regularly seen offshore in the winter months as well. The bird on the left of our slide is the endangered piping plover, which also winters on Tybee's beaches. Here on the left, we have a picture of a northern gannet performing its arrow-like dive into the ocean for fish. Again, these can usually be seen off the coast in winter, but sometimes they come in closer to shore as well. I've seen individuals sitting on the water just off the end of a fishing pier before, so it's not unheard of to see them without needing binoculars. Uh, in the summer, they migrate much further north up the coast uh, into northeastern Canada, then make their way southward along our coast, um, along our part of the coast, into Florida and around the Gulf of Mexico. In the middle, we have a very special one of Tybee's nesting songbirds, the gray kingbird, which only nests in a handful of areas here in Georgia, which is itself only a recent phenomenon that started within the last 20 or so years. They announce their presence loudly and are generally easy to spot when you know where they're likely to hang out. On Tybee, the most well-known spot is around the parking lot near Hotel Tybee on the south end of the island. Um, the gray kingbird is typically a bird of the Caribbean, but as stated before, they've expanded their summer range to include parts of Georgia in the summer. And on the right, we have a more typical yet nonetheless stunning shorebird that nests on Tybee called the Royal Term. You can see two adults here doing a courtship dance in the summer. Uh, these birds are hard to miss with their bright orange beaks, jet black caps, and graceful profiles in flight. They can be seen all over the island, but the north end at high tide is where you'll see the largest number of them, as well as other shorebirds. Uh, there are permanent populations of royal terns all along the southeastern coast, California, the Gulf of Mexico, and Central America, but some populations do migrate further north in the summer and further south in the winter especially moving further off the coast and into the Caribbean. Next up is a wetland not far from Tybee, the Savannah Wildlife Refuge. Uh, it lies right next to Savannah, uh, partially in Georgia and partially in South Carolina, and consists of mostly freshwater tidal habitats, but also bottomland and mixed hardwood, open meadows, and pine floodplains. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who managed the refuge, uh, it was also established in April 6th of 1927. The refuge is 31,551 acres of wetland, with 3,000 acres of it being historical rice paddies that were left to become habitat. In the summer, swallowtail kites, painted buntings, and leased bitterns, like the one on our slide, uh, here can be found uh, on the refuge. Uh, just to name a few. During spring and fall migration, blue-winged warblers, bobolinks, solitary sandpipers, soras, and more all pass through these wetlands for food and shelter on their ways to and from their summer and winter grounds. In the winter, uh, the refuge provides important habitat for waterfowl like the gadwall, green-winged teal, blue-winged teal, northern shoveler, and American widgeon, among other birds. Again, these are just a handful of species that use the refuge seasonally. Now, I know I've got a great blue heron up on here. Um, they are non-migratory, but it's also a nice picture of kind of what some of the habitat looks like. So remember at the beginning of our talk where I mentioned that some birds migrate using magnetic senses and some navigate by the stars? Uh, according to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, bobolinks, like the breeding male on the left, can do both. Uh, Cornell states on their All About Birds entry for the bobolink that a migrating bobolink can orient itself with the Earth's magnetic field thanks to iron oxide and bristles of the nasal cavity and in tissues around the olfactory bulb and nerve. Bobolinks also use the starry night sky to guide their travels. Uh, these birds breed in the northern states and Canada but make their way through Georgia during migration to and from their homes in South America. In the middle, we have what is, in my humble opinion, one of our most spectacular birds of prey, the swallow-tailed kite. Uh, focused mainly on airborne prey like large insects, uh, these birds absolutely command respect when you see them. These birds migrate uh, to spend the summer here from South America, 
Uh, this is almost the northernmost part of their summer range uh, here at the Savannah Wildlife Refuge, that is, uh, with the middle of South Carolina coast being the absolute northernmost limit. So last but not least, on the right we have a male and female gadwall, which is one of several duck species that spend their winters on the refuge. Uh, these birds breed much farther north and west, uh, but widely dispersed across North America and into Central America in the winter. They may not be the most colorful of waterfowl, but their subtle grays and browns are beautiful nonetheless. They're also known for stealing food from other ducks. So just 45 miles south of Savannah, we have Harris Neck National Wildlife Refuge. It lies to the south of the Newport River in McIntosh County and consists of freshwater and saltwater ponds, salt marshes, pine woodlands, and open fields. The star of the refuge is the year-round resident, the wood stork, uh, but it's used by many migrating birds as well. In the summer, you have birds like black neck stilts, yellow-billed cuckoos, prairie warblers, purple gallinules, painted buntings, and more that use the refuge for feeding and nesting. In the winter, it's important wetlands for many waterfowl and wading birds like buffleheads, ruddy ducks, redheads, greater and lesser yellow legs, spotted sandpipers, and many more, like the American bittern on the left of our slide. In the fall and spring, warbler species like the American red star, northern water thrush, and yellow warbler all pass through. According to the Fish and Wildlife Service, 342 bird species have been recorded in the refuge and 83 species regularly nest there. Okay, so on the left we have a yellow rumped warbler in its winter plumage. Uh, these are very common on the coast in the winter but are nonetheless very pretty and a lot of fun to watch flitting through the bushes in groups. Uh, their bright yellow rump uh, contrasting with their gray and brown winter plumage is a dead giveaway to their identity. These birds nest much further north and west into Canada's far north, uh, but have a, a highly expansive range across North America and into Central America in the winter. And they're all over Georgia in the winter uh, as well, not just the coast, but predominantly there. In the middle, we have a ruddy duck in its winter plumage, uh, which is how they look once they arrive on the refuge until it's time to uh, head back north at which point the male's body will turn a beautiful rusty red and his bill will turn a bright powder blue. Like the gadwall we discussed beforehand, these birds nest much further north and west of us, but greatly disperse across North America and Central America in the winter. There's even a permanent population in the Caribbean. Okay, so I mentioned these birds a little bit earlier, but on the right we have the absolutely gorgeous, absolutely unforgettable, stunning, Roseate Spoonbill. Uh, Harris Neck is one of only a very small number of places in Georgia where they've been recorded nesting, but they're not uncommon to see here in the summer nonetheless. Uh, they're often mistaken for flamingos, but they're not related at all. Uh, they fill a similar role in the ecosystem, and they also get their pink feather pigment from these shellfish that they eat. Uh, they're also commonly seen around Jekyll Island, another important migration spot that we talked about earlier today. Uh, they're usually pretty sedentary and are most common in the Caribbean and Central America, but they are known to migrate to a handful of small places to spend the summer throughout their range, with the marshes around Jekyll and Harris Snack being two of them. Okay, so looking southward once again, we have the Altamaha Wildlife Management Area. It's located just south of Darien uh, on the southern half of the coast and according to the Audubon Society is one of the most productive areas in Georgia for waterfowl, rails, wading birds, and the like. The DNR states on their website that the management area is 3,154 acres of managed waterfowl impoundments and some 27,000 acres of bottomland hardwoods and cypress to below swamps. In the summer, migratory birds like the least bittern, black necked stilt, roseate spoonbill, indigo bunting, and painted buntings are all known to nest and inhabit the wetlands and swamps. In the winter, American bitterns, uh, yellow rumped warblers, savannah sparrows, northern harriers, and American white pelicans 
uh, our regular winter residents. So I mentioned earlier in the program, sometimes birds take different routes in their spring versus fall migrations. Uh, and here are a few examples of uh, birds that do that here at this refuge. In the spring, bobolinks, long-billed dowitchers, and solitary sandpipers regularly make their way through the refuge. And in the fall, yellow warblers, soras, pectoral sandpipers, and prairie warblers, like the one above, and northern water thrushes are more likely to visit uh, the Altamaha uh, wildlife management area on their way south in the fall. So on our left here, we have one of the refuge's fall slash winter visitors, the Sora. These secretive marsh birds like to hang out low in reeds of the refuge's wetlands and can be quite tough to spot. If you're lucky enough to see one though, they're quite stunning. Soras nest much farther north and out into the western part of North America but migrate to the coast, the Caribbean, Mexico, and the rest of Central America in the winter. Uh, in the middle, we have a northern water thrush, uh, who you're likely to see in the spring and fall, uh, dramatically bobbing its tail up and down along the waterways. These are actually a species of warbler, like the colorful prairie warbler on the previous slide, uh, but don't let their earth tones fool you. They're quite beautiful to see in the wild and hard to miss with their exaggerated tail dance. In the summer, they nest high up in the northern boreal forests, but migrate to Central America and the Caribbean in the winter. And on the right, uh, we have a summer migrant, uh, the black-necked stilt. These birds wade through the shallow wetlands and marshes in search of fish and shellfish to eat, uh, and nest on little clumps of land or vegetation sitting above the water. Their long pink legs and striking plumage make them quite a sight to see. Much of this bird's permanent range is in Mexico, the Caribbean, Central and South America, but there are migratory breeding populations in certain areas across North America, including along our coasts. Okay, now that we've spent some time by the water, we're going to set our sights on more dry inland areas. So Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park is the site of a historical battle, but it's also a high traffic area for migratory birds. The National Park Service's website for the park even states that it was designated as a globally important bird area in the year 2000. Uh, consisting of forests and open fields, the 2,965 acre park sits at the southern end of the Appalachian Mountains, which puts it right in the center of the migration path of many warblers, vireos, and other migratory songbirds making their way to or along the Appalachians. Birds like the endangered cerulean warbler, shown on our slide here, uh, scarlet tanager, black-throated blue warbler, black-throated green warbler, and red-eyed vireo can all be seen here during the spring. Uh, even birds like sandhill cranes, black-billed cuckoos, and olive-sided flycatchers are semi-regularly seen here during migration as well. According to the Audubon Society's website on the best places in Georgia to see birds, uh, fall isn't quite as spectacular as spring migration, but still good. Uh, of course, the park is also home to a number of breeding species in the summer, like eastern wood peewees, yellow-throated vireos, and northern rough-wing swallows. Uh, in the winter, golden crown kinglets, brown creepers, and winter wrens can be found spending their time in the area. Overall, though, this place uh, is most important as a um, passing through part of the Atlantic Flyway. Okay, so on the left we have a male black-throated green warbler in full breeding plumage. These canopy-dwelling warblers may be a tad hard to see without binoculars, but can be easily heard persistently singing their buzzy songs in the springtime from the tops of trees. If you do catch a glimpse of one though, the male's lemon yellow, black, white, and blue-gray plumage is quite a treat to see. Uh, in the middle, we have a summer migrant, the red-eyed vireo. These birds are common summer visitors throughout much of the state and, like the black-throated green warbler, are a bit difficult to see as they hang out in the forest canopies looking for insects to eat. But they have a rambling song that they sing over and over and over and over, making them fairly easy to identify by ear. Uh, we banned a lot of these birds on Jekyll Island as they make their way back to Central and South America in the fall. Just a kind of a fun fact. And on the right, 
we have a uh, male scarlet tanager in his summer plumage. Another summer resident to the park that likes to hang out in the tops of trees, but if you get lucky enough to catch a glimpse of their beautiful plumages, it's something you're not likely to forget. Uh, this is about the southernmost limit of their summer range, but these birds nest all the way up into southern Canada, then make their way back to South America in the fall. Okay, so located 25 miles north of Macon in Jones County is Piedmont National Wildlife Refuge, a site that the Audubon Society calls one of the best all-round birding sites in inland Georgia. According to the Fish and Wildlife Service, the refuge was founded in 1939 by uh, Ira Gabrielson, uh, chief of the Bureau of Biological Survey, which was the agency that preceded the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and he set it up to prove that wildlife could be restored to worn out and used up land. Luckily, he was right, and the 35,000 acre reserve is covered in loblolly pine forest, hardwoods, and wetlands that are home to a number of residents and migratory birds. In the summer, it is home to wood thrushes, like the one pictured on the left, Kentucky warblers, Acadian flycatchers, blue grosbeaks, um, Kentucky warblers, and orchard orioles, uh, much more. In the winter, white-throated sparrows, cedar waxwings, eastern phoebes are some of the songbirds that uh, show up and arrive and spend their winters here. And the refuge's wetlands also become inhabited by migratory waterfowl in the winter. You probably caught on to a theme here, such as ringneck ducks, American black ducks, and hooded mergansers. While the refuge is more important as nesting and wintering habitat, it is admittedly more so vital as a winter or summer destination than a stopover point in the spring and fall. So on the left, we have one of my personal favorites, the black and white warbler. This common nester is one of the earliest arrivals in spring, and it's the only warbler in North America that creeps up and down tree trunks like a nuthatch, and their beautiful high contrast plumage is quite a spectacle. These birds have a large wintering range that includes Central and South America, as well as the Caribbean islands. However, they also winter on our coast and into Florida. In the middle, we have a female American black duck, one of the refuge's winter residents. Both sexes look a bit like female mallards, but are overall much darker with more highly contrasting underwings and have pale gray faces. They often flock with mallards in the winter too, so pay careful attention and you might spot a few hiding in plain sight. These birds nest much farther north into Canada and come down the coast in the winter, but they are seen year round uh, just southeast of the Canadian border and along the coast thereabouts. On the right, we have an adult male orchard oriole. The summer resident is our only nesting oriole in the state and also the smallest oriole in North America. Look for them hanging out in the tops of trees, giving their whistle calls that occasionally have harsh interjections. They have a large uh, summer range across eastern North America and migrate to central and northern South America for the winter. Finally, last on our list is the highest mountain in Georgia at the base of the Appalachians. It's Brasstown Bald in the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest. The peak of the mountain sits at 4,784 feet above sea level in the very northern part of the state in Hiawassee. Uh, its forests are an important summer home for migratory birds like the rose-breasted grosbeak, like the male uh, on our slide, Viri, Canada warbler, uh, scarlet tanager, black-throated green warbler, broad-winged hawk, blue-headed vireo, worm-eating warbler, and chestnut-sided warbler to name a few. Uh, most of the migratory birds that breed here also breed further north, so most of the birds that pass through here on their ways uh, to their breeding ground or southward to their wintering grounds also have populations that breed here, so the variety of birds doesn't change too much during spring and fall. In the winter, however, it's mostly resident species that use the mountain. Uh, I don't want to downplay how amazing these year-round residents are, but since today's talk is about migratory birds, I'll save that for another day. Okay, so on the left, we have the broad-winged hawk. 
Uh, these birds spend their summer here and then migrate in mass to Central and South America. Hawk identification is tricky, especially since a number uh, of our local species are fairly similar, but a good way to set them ap these apart from other hawks is to look for a large hawk with mostly straight angled wings in flight, uh, pale splotchy striped underwings, and a broadly striped tail. Uh, these birds are also more often found inland rather than near the coast. In the middle, we have an adult male black-throated blue warbler, another personal favorite of mine. Uh, these summer residents um, are a fan of hanging out in the understory and lower canopies, so they're not quite as tricky to see as some of the other birds we've talked about. Their dazzling plumage is almost, uh, well, it's, it's just straight up unmistakable um, in adult males, and they will keep their fancy colors through spring and fall. These birds migrate into the Caribbean islands in the winter and have a small population in Central America too. Uh, they're also commonly banded as a part of the Jekyll Island banding station I mentioned earlier. And finally, on the right, we have an adult male Canada warbler. So Brasstown Bald is the absolute southernmost part of their breeding range and most of the time these birds are found nesting way far north in the boreal forests of Canada before making their long trip back to their wintering grounds in South America. These birds love to hang out in forests with brushy understory, so instead of straining your neck to look up, you want to keep your eyes peeled around eye level for these fantastic birds. So that's all I have for you today. Uh, I will go through these slides and kind of show you um, the sources where I got all this information from, so I highly encourage you if you're interested to go through these and give these a look. Um, you can always use your Pines card to put some great bird books on hold as well at gapines.org or call any of our libraries for more assistance. Um, and on behalf of the Augusta Richmond County Library System, I'd like to thank you for tuning in and I wish you happy birding.